God is good. Yes. Be turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Everybody say week after next. Week after next. You don't want to miss week after next. You don't want to miss week after next. <laughs> on, the, on that Wednesday night, I'm going to bring forth a word that I am just in awe. And after 30 years of in-depth study of the word and 28 years teaching the word, it's hard to impress me with something. But I, when I sat there that night and prepared that teaching, I was just speechless. Normally, I get excited, and I get just as excited at home when I'm studying by myself as I do here in front of y'all. I'll throw my laptop down and jump in the middle of my living room floor, and I'll dance, and I'll shout before the Lord over a revelation or over something I see in the Word. But that night, I was just so in awe. I just sat there in silence and tears rolled down my cheeks. And I hadn't looked at the calendar to see what week Passover was. But guess what week it is? It's that week. When Passover begins at sundown on Friday night of that week. And it's no accident that the Holy Spirit gave me that word for that week. You don't want to miss that word. Like I said... It takes a lot to impress me because I've heard thousands and thousands of sermons and teachings over the years. And I've studied and I've taught hundreds and hundreds of times. That's one of the most powerful revelations that the Holy Spirit has ever given me. And I can't wait to share with you. So don't miss week after next. Genesis chapter 15. We began last week studying the blood covenant that God cut with Abraham. And we're going to continue with that covenant tonight and finish the Abrahamic covenant up. This is an awesome, awesome example of a blood covenant in the word of God. In Genesis chapter 15 and verses 1 through 3, Abraham said to God, God, I don't have a son. Now, what will you give me, God, seeing that I am childless and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? Verse 3, and Abraham or Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And if you have a Bible translation that says, One born in my house shall be my heir, will be my heir, I'm going to make him my heir, it's wrong. The, the original Hebrew says, the one born in my house is mine heir. And we learned last week that Abram had performed the rite of adoption ceremony and had already adopted Eleazar as his son. And we learned last week about how the rite of adoption was performed in the East in Bible days. Did you enjoy learning about adoption? That is one of my favorite subjects. And I just told you one aspect of adoption. But you remember I told you a couple of stories. I, I told you about the eagle and how the mother eagle adopts that orphan baby eaglet. And then I told you about Bobby Thompson's sister and her husband adopting a little girl. And how the kids was making fun of this little girl because she was adopted. Aren't kids cruel to one another? And Bobby told her, said, honey, don't you worry. You've been chosen. Your mom and daddy chose you. Those other kids, mom and daddy had to take them. But your mom and daddy chose you and picked you out. And that's what Jesus did to us. He chose us. He chose us. We've been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And we have been given the right of adoption. We've been adopted into the family of God. Whereby we can cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. We've been adopted. We have had the right of adoption ceremony. Done by the Lord Jesus Christ. By him Placing his blood upon us and adopting us 
into the family of God and bringing us into the Father. What a privilege we have had to be adopted. So Abram had adopted Eleazar as his son. He had performed the right of adoption. But God said, no, this man is not going to be your heir. You're going to have a son of your own, and your son shall be your heir. Abram said, now, God, how will I know that you're going to do this? How can that possibly be? Abram couldn't wrap his mind around the fact that God was going to perform a miracle like that for him. And so in order for God to bring Abram to the point that he could have faith to believe God's word, God cut a blood covenant with Abram. And God told Abram to select some animals. In verse 9 of chapter 15 of Genesis, God said, now you take a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Why did he choose three animals? You remember I told you that these three animals represent the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And how God and Jesus walked between the pieces of these animals and cut the covenant for Abraham. And the turtle dove, the young pigeon, what is a symbol, one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit? It's a dove, a dove. The Holy Spirit was present that night. That dove represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was present in Genesis at creation. When God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was dark. It was void without form. And the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit hovered, brooded. Just like an eagle hovering and brooding over her young. That's what the Holy Spirit was doing at creation. The Holy Spirit is always present upon the earth. The Holy Spirit is the one, the one of the three of the Godhead that is here with us on earth now. God the Father is in heaven. Jesus the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And the, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is here with us on the earth now. And the Holy Spirit was present that night. When God cut this blood covenant. The Holy Spirit was present. Hovering. Brooding. Overseeing. What was taking place. And in Genesis chapter 15. Verses 17 through 18. Tells us that when the sun went down. And it was dark. Behold a smoking furnace. And a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And we learned last week that the smoking furnace was God. Walking through the divided pieces of those animals. Abraham saw the smoke. That smoke was the Shekinah glory of God. This is the first instance of the Shekinah glory of God appearing in the Bible. Abraham saw God's glory. He saw the smoke of the cloud of the glory of God. Just like Moses saw the smoke of the cloud of the glory on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 verse 18. Oh, but not only is God smoke, but God is also fire. Hebrews 12, 29 tells us that our God is a consuming fire. And the burning lamp that Abram saw along with the smoking furnace, the burning lamp was Jesus. Because in the word of God. Jesus is described as a burning lamp. Exodus just gives us a wonderful picture here. Of God the Father and Jesus the Son. Jesus is that burning lamp. Psalms 119 verse 105 says. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. Jesus is the word that was made flesh. John 114 says. Jesus not only is the word that was made flesh. He is the light of the world. John chapter 1 verse 9. Not only is he the word, not only is he that burning lamp, not only is he light, but oh, Jesus is also fire. He's 
Fire from his loins downward, he's fire. And from his loins upward, he's fire. Ezekiel 8, 2 says. And when God and Jesus walked between the divided pieces of these animals in a figure 8, they was saying in essence, this covenant that we are cutting right now at this moment, this covenant that is now being made is for time and eternity. It will never end. That's what the figure eight, a symbol of infinity means. And God and Jesus themselves came down to this earth and walked between the divided pieces of those animals and cut this covenant. And it was, it's an everlasting covenant. It will never end. And God recited the blessings and the curses of the covenant. That's one of the nine steps of cutting a blood covenant is that the curses and the blessings of the covenant are recited. God recited the blessings and the curses to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verses 2. Two through three is one passage where God tells Abram the blessings and the curses. God says in Genesis chapter 12 verses two through three, and I will make of thee a great nation, God tells Abram, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3 says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God swore by himself to keep the terms of the covenant. Because there was none greater for God to swear by. So he swore by himself. Exodus chapter 32 verse 13 tells us. And then there was the exchange of names. That's one of the steps in cutting a blood covenant. God changed Abram's name from Abram to Abraham which means father of a multitude. And God took Abraham's name and God called himself from that time forward the God of Abraham. And I gave you four passages last week and I'll just give you one tonight. Matthew twenty-two thirty-two 32 is one of the times where God called himself the God of Abraham. Now that's all the time that we have for a review. We're going to begin tonight and finish this covenant that God cut. God is a covenant making God. God is a covenant keeping God. God acts only within covenant and God does nothing toward redemption that is outside of the covenant. Our God is a covenant God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, Making a scar is another one of the steps in cutting a blood covenant. And the scar is the guarantee. And it's also the seal of the blood covenant. And the scar for Abraham as the sign of the covenant was circumcision. God said to Abraham, turn to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 2. God said to Abram, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Verse 7. God says, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for a what? An everlasting covenant covenant. What kind of covenant is the Abrahamic covenant? It's an everlasting covenant. Is the Abrahamic covenant still in existence for day, today? Yes, it is. It is an everlasting covenant. And then God explained to Abraham how he was to enter into that covenant of blood friendship with Almighty God. God told Abram, in Genesis chapter 17, beginning in verse 10, God said, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. 
Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you, God says. And in verse 12, God told Abram, every male was to be circumcised when he was eight days old. In the last part of verse 13, God says, my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14 says, and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. He hath what? Broken my covenant. One of the curses for not keeping the Abrahamic covenant was you would be cut off. In other words, you would die. And it, in Moses' day, when the children of Israel, if there was uh, any one of the children of Israel that broke the covenant, do you know what they did to them? They took them outside the, the gates and they stoned them. That would teach them not to do that anymore, wouldn't it? So the curse of breaking the blood covenant was death. You remember, Moses had not circumcised his son. And the word says that God sought to kill him. And Moses' wife, Zipporah, circumcised his son. If she hadn't have done it, Mo would have dropped dead right there. Because he had broken the covenant. The curse of breaking a covenant is death. A blood covenant is not ever to be broken. And if you break it, whether it's between two men, whether it's between men and God, like this Abrahamic covenant, if you break the blood covenant, the penalty is death. If you break a blood covenant in Africa, if any of the nations that still have the blood covenant and still cut the covenant, if one party breaks that blood covenant, the other party will hunt them down and kill them. And their own family will hunt them down and kill them. If you break the blood covenant, you will die. It will, your family and the other blood covenant partner and their family will hunt you down. You do not break the blood covenant. So God said, if anyone breaks it, they're going to be cut off from among these people. Why? If, you don't, if you're not going to be circumcised, then you have broken my covenant and you will be cut off from your people. God said this blood covenant of friendship will be consummated, Abram, by you giving me of your own personal blood. Where? At the very source of paternity or under his girdle as, the, as it was called in Bible days. God didn't cut the covenant with Abraham by cutting his wrist like most blood covenants are cut. God said, you will be circumcised every man child on the eighth day. And God said, not only will you be pledging yourself to me, but you're also going to be pledging all of those who come from you, all of your descendants, all of your seed, every male child was circumcised on the eighth day in obedience to the Abrahamic covenant in order to keep this covenant that God cut with Abram. Jesus shed his blood in circumcision when he was eight days old in order to keep this covenant that God cut with Abraham. You can jot this scripture down in Luke chapter 2 verse 21. When eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. And when the time of the, of the purification for Mary was ended, she brought the offering to the temple. And what was the offering? Two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And what was the birds that Abram was told to offer? Turtle dove and a pigeon. Just a coincidence, right? Not. Nothing in the word is an accident. Nothing in the word is by coincidence. Everything in the word is significant. Verse 26. 
in the self same day was Abram circumcised. And he also circumcised his other son, which God didn't even acknowledge. God called Isaac his only begotten son. But you remember that Abram had a son by Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. And Abram circumcised this child also. From this day forward, Abram bore in his flesh the evidence that he had entered into a blood covenant of friendship with Almighty God. And in Bible days, to bear in the flesh the marks of being devoted to a God or to a deity, it was widely observed. It was a custom that was practiced in the East in Bible days. And Paul gives us a snippet of this. He shows us this in Galatians chapter 6 verse 17. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I want to read you a short quote from Barnes Notes. Barnes says that the word here rendered marks in Galatians chapter 6 17. Where Paul said, I bear in my body the marks. This word rendered marks is stigmata in the Greek. And it means the marks are brands which are pricked or burnt in upon the body. Slaves were sometimes branded by their masters to prevent their escape. And so devotees to an idol god sometimes cause to be impressed on themselves the name or the image of the divinity which they adored. Many have supposed that Paul here says in allusion to such a custom. That he had the name of the redeemer impressed on his body. And that he regarded himself as devoted to him and his cause. End quote. Now what is this saying? What were the marks of the Lord Jesus, the redeemer, that were impressed upon Paul's body? The scars that he bore in his body were the marks of the, of the Redeemer. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus. He bore the scars of being beaten, stoned, whipped. And jot this scripture down. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 25. Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And said in stripes above measure of the Jews. Five times I received three stripes save one. Think about it. He was beaten, whipped with the cat of nine tails. Five times. And he says, thrice or three times was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Do you not think Paul's body had some marks on it? He says, I bear in my body the marks, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus. That was what Paul bore. Abram bore the marks. He bore the scars to prove that he was in blood covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And us today as New Testament Christians, we are circumcised where? In our hearts instead of being circumcised in our flesh. And the instrument that God uses is not a knife, but it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Circumcises our heart. Our hearts Bears the marks, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. We are marked on our heart. If we could see it, our heart is marked. Our heart is scarred. Our heart is circumcised. We bear the marks in our spirit of being in the Abrahamic covenant. Just as the natural Jews bear the marks in their flesh. We bear the marks in our heart, in our spirit. We have been circumcised to be brought into the Abrahamic covenant. So that all of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant are for us today. Now, another step in, in cutting the blood covenant is giving of the covenant terms. And God himself gave the covenant terms to Abram. 
when two people entered into a blood covenant in Bible days, would stand before witnesses and give the terms of the covenant, pledging to commit all that they have to one another. And they will say to each other, all of my wealth, all of my assets, all of my possessions are yours. All that I have becomes yours, but all that you have becomes mine. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God told Abraham, In thee, in you, Abraham, shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham not only understood that all that God had belonged to him, but Abraham also understood that all that he had belonged to God. It goes both ways in a blood covenant. What is yours becomes mine. What is mine becomes yours. And God tested Abram to prove him. To see if he would be obedient and keep the terms of this blood covenant friendship. God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac as a burnt offering. And Abraham instantly obeyed the call of his divine blood covenant friend. Our western minds cannot grasp the magnitude of this request. In the east, a father prizes his only son's life far more than his own life. The father would much rather die himself instead of his son. So to ask a father to give up his son, his only son, was asking for the one thing that was more dear to the father than life itself. Isaac was more dear to Abraham's heart than his own life. But since Abraham knew that all that he had belonged to God. He knew that God had a right to ask him to offer up his only son Isaac as a burnt offering. But how? Could Abraham bring himself to raise that knife to kill his son Isaac? Because Abraham had watched God perform the walk of blood. Walking between those two bloody halves of those animals. Those three animals that were cut in two. They fell open creating a walkway of blood. And the two halves of each of those three animals. As they were laying side by side. And God himself walked in the walk of blood. Through these divided pieces of the animals. God walked it through them as that smoking furnace the night that he cut covenant with Abram in Genesis chapter 15 verse 17. And you know what? I believe that Abraham could see God's footprints in that blood. I believe it was so real. And when, when Abraham was watching this take place. I believe that he, he could watch and he could see God's footprints walking in that blood. Cutting the blood covenant and standing there in blood. God swore the oath of that covenant. In Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 through 14. It says, for when God made promise. What kind of promise? Covenant promises to Abraham. Because he could swear by no greater. He swear or swore by himself. Saying, surely blessing I will bless thee. And multiplying I will multiply thee. There was none greater. So God swore by himself to Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. Saying unto thy seed have I given this land. God had promised Abraham that his seed would be as numerous as the stars in the heaven. And as numerous as the sands on the seashore. And God had told Abraham. He had took him outside. And he had told him to look up at the stars. And put a face on those stars. And picture your descendants God said oh but at the time that Abraham was told to offer up Isaac Isaac did not have any children yet so could Isaac have descendants that would become as, as numerous as the stars in the heavens when he didn't have any children when God told Abraham to offer Isaac up as a burnt offering no and if Abraham had killed Isaac, how 
could he have descendants that were numberless? How could God fulfill his promise to give his descendants that they would be so numerous that they couldn't be counted or numbered? How could God fulfill that if, if Isaac was dead and if he had offered him up as a burnt sacrifice? Think about it. When Abraham was offering up Isaac, he had to have pictured in his mind the scene that night of God walking in blood and cutting that blood covenant. And Abraham had to have remembered God's promises to multiply his seed. So for Isaac to die having no children was absolutely impossible, wasn't it? Abraham knew that God had to keep his oath that he had swore. Abraham knew that if he killed Isaac, that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham had an inner image within him of Isaac being raised up from those ashes after he burned him as that living sacrifice. How do we know this is true? Because the word of God says it is. The word of God says that Abraham believed in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19. The word said that Abraham, he believed that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham didn't know at that time that God was going to send an angel to stop his hand. He lifted that knife in order to plunge it into his son Isaac. And he didn't know at that time that God was going to send an angel to stop him. Abraham knew that he was told to sacrifice his son. So he was going to be obedient. Because he had received Isaac in a figure. He had pictured in his mind of God raising Isaac from the dead, of recreating him from the ashes after being burnt on that altar. Abraham, Hebrews eleven nine 9 says that he received Isaac from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. In Abraham's mind, Isaac was already dead. In his spirit, he saw a picture of Isaac being resurrected from the dead. Abraham also saw that night Isaac being resurrected as a figure, a similitude. That's what that word figure means. It means a similitude, a pattern. It means a picture. And that night, Abraham not only saw Isaac being raised from the dead, but he saw Jesus being resurrected from the dead also. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Jesus said, Abraham saw all my day. Abraham lived thousands of years before Jesus was born and before Jesus went to the cross. But yet Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. When did Abraham see Jesus' day? When Abraham was up on Mount Moriah offering up Isaac, he saw Jesus, the Lamb of God, being offered up on that same mountain because Mount Moriah and Mount Calvary is the same place. When Abraham was offering up Isaac and when God sent the angel to stay his hand and God told him to lift up his eyes and he saw a ram caught in the thicket. And what is a ram? It is a male lamb caught in the thicket by his thorns. That male lamb had a crown of of thorns around its head. It was a picture of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would come thousands of years later and be crowned with a crown of thorns and be offered up on Mount Calvary, which is the same place as Mount Moriah. To Abraham, Isaac was already dead. And in his spirit, he pictured Isaac being resurrected from the dead immediately after he burned him as that burnt offering. As, as that sacrifice 
Abraham had already settled it before he and Isaac went up on that mountain. Because Abraham told his servants in Genesis chapter 22 verse 5. Abraham told his servants, I and the lad will go yonder in worship and come again to you. This is plural. Abraham told his servants, hey boys, me and my boy, me and my son Isaac, we're going up on top of the mountain. And we're going to worship up there there but we are coming back down we are coming back down how did could Abraham say that because he had already received it in a figure he had already seen Isaac being offered up and him slaying his son and burning him as a burnt offering unto the Lord and then he had already saw him in a figure he had already saw God raising him from the dead raising him from those ashes hallelujah Abraham went up that mountain with the full expectation of sacrificing his son Isaac. And since he expected Isaac to return with him. Abraham believed that God would raise Isaac up immediately from the dead. Now think about it. By Abram's willingness to offer up Isaac. He showed that he was willing to fulfill the covenant terms. And because Abraham was willing to fulfill the covenant terms and offer up his son, then God would have to be willing to offer up his son, Jesus, in proof of his fidelity to keep the blood covenant of friendship that he had cut that night with his friend, Abraham. God spared Abraham's only son Isaac but God would not spare his only son Jesus Romans chapter 8 verse 32 he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all God made his only son Jesus the sacrificial offering so that through Jesus the covenant of blood friendship between him and the spiritual seed of Abraham which is you and me so that that the covenant between us and God could become a reality. Abraham had given of his own blood to God by the right of circumcision. And now God was to give his own blood through the blood of his son Jesus for the spiritual seed of Abraham. That's you and that's me. Hallelujah. We didn't have to shed our blood. Jesus shed his blood for you and shed his blood for me. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 says. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Hallelujah. Jesus our covenant blood brother. Shed his blood for us. Hallelujah. So that we could be brought into the Abraham. Abrahamic covenant and inherit the blessings. Hallelujah. We cannot grasp the magnitude of this. For the God, he had to offer his only son, Jesus, as a sacrifice. Why? Because his covenant partner, Abraham, had laid his only son upon the altar in response to the command of his covenant partner, God. God said, you go offer that boy on the altar as a sacrifice. And Abraham said, all right, I will. And because Abraham was obedient and ought to offer his son up, then God had to be obedient to offer his only son. God laid his, his son on the altar just as Abraham laid Isaac upon the altar. Abraham raised that sacrificial knife to spill his son's blood. Therefore, all of the courts of justice now demanded that when the time came, God Almighty had to put his own son on the altar of sacrifice because God's covenant partner, Abraham, was willing to do it. Then God had to do it himself. 
in response to his blood covenant friend Abraham. Abraham believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Therefore, God had the right to, to raise Jesus up from the dead. Hallelujah. It's a covenant relationship all the way down. Hallelujah. Everything God told O Abe to do, God had to be willing to do it himself. And he did it not for him, but he did it for you and for me. Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. After the blood covenant is cut between two parties, from that day forth, they are known as friends. From that very day forward, in Bible days, you became a friend with someone only after you cut a blood covenant with them. In Proverbs chapter 18 verse 20, 24. The word of, of God says. There is a friend. That sticketh closer than a brother. What is this talking about? We thought it was just talking about a buddy. A pal. Uh-uh. It's talking about a blood covenant brother. Being closer than a natural born brother. You've heard the term all of your life, blood is thicker than water. You've heard the term, blood is thicker than milk. With our Gentile minds, we don't have a clue what that means. The original meaning of the phrase, blood is thicker than water, meant that the blood covenant cut between two people is thicker than the water of the mother's womb. The blood covenant is thicker it is more powerful it is more binding than two natural born mothers that shared the same womb of the same mother and the phrase blood is thicker than milk meant the milk of the mother's breast it meant that my relationship with those that i'm in joined in blood covenant with is closer than the relationship with my natural born physical brother even though we shared the same womb of their mother and even though we shared the same breast milk the one that I'm in blood covenant with that relationship is stronger than the relationship of my natural born physical brother that's what those phrases mean a covenant friend is closer than a brother born in your natural family you remember the night I taught on the salt covenant and my sister came and I said, I want to enter into a salt covenant with you because when you enter into a salt covenant with someone, you can enter into a salt covenant or a blood covenant with your own brother, with your own sister. And that covenant is more binding than the relationship of you being physically birth to the same mother proverbs chapter 17 verse 17 says a friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity a covenant brother a covenant friend loves at all times proverbs says but a natural born physical brother is born for adversity. How many families do you know that brothers and sisters get into arguments? Sometimes they stay mad at each other for years. Sometimes natural born brothers and sisters won't speak to each other for years. Even when a parent dies, one of the siblings won't come to the funeral because they're mad at one of the other siblings because they think that they're going to get more of an inheritance or what other silly reason. Proverbs says, a friend loveth at all times. When you enter into a blood covenant with someone, you are bound to them for life. Never can it be broken. You can't get mad at them. You can't say, I don't want to have anything else to do with you. Not, you're in blood covenant with them. Everything they have belongs to you. And everything that you have belongs to, th to them. Uh, covenant friend loves at all times the word says and after God cut the covenant with Abraham God himself called Abraham his 
friend. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 8. The word of God says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. God said, Hey, Abraham is my friend. He is my blood covenant friend. You only had the title of friend in Bible days after you entered into a blood covenant with them. Jehoshaphat, when he was praying to God, Jehoshaphat called God Abraham's friend. And he called Abraham God's friend. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 7, Jehoshaphat is praying and to God and he says, Hey, art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? Hallelujah. How did they get title deed to the land? Through the covenant that God cut with Abraham, his Friend, James chapter 2, verse 23, if you want a New Testament scripture. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was puted unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Hallelujah. The covenant of blood, or the covenant of strong friendship, as it is still called in the east to this day. This covenant of blood produced this covenant friendship between God and and Abraham his friend. And just as God called Abraham his friend. Jesus calls us his friend. Why? Because he cut the blood covenant for you and for me. And Jesus calls us his friend. Friend, John chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Just any kind of a casual acquaintance, just any kind of buddy that you like real well, no, his friends, his blood covenant friends. Verse 14 of John 15, Jesus said, you, you are my friends. If you do whatsoever, I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for a servant knoweth not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father. I have made known unto you. What a privilege we have to be called the friend of Jesus. Hallelujah. The very Son of God. Why do we have that right? Why do we have that privilege of being called Jesus' friend? Because we are in blood covenant. Jesus is our blood covenant brother. Hallelujah. We are blood friends with Jesus. Everything that Jesus has is, belongs to us. Everything we have belongs to him. Hallelujah. And eating a covenant meal was another step in cutting the blood covenant. That's one of the nine steps of cutting a blood covenant in Bible days. God and Abraham ate a covenant meal together. They ate two meals together, as a matter of fact. The first one is Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 19. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 19. Susan Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And we've talked about it before. No one knows who Melchizedek is, whether an angelic being or whether it's the Lord Jesus. Some people, some theologians believe that this is a theophany, which is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus. Nobody knows who Melchizedek is. All we know is that Melchizedek appeared to Abram and he brought forth what? Bread 
and wine. That's a covenant meal. Where two people cut a blood covenant, they took one loaf of bread, they broke it in two, and they dipped it in salt, and they fed that piece of bread to their covenant partner. Then they took that cup of wine, and they each drank part of that cup of wine. They partook of a covenant meal. And this is exactly what Melchizedek and Abraham did. They ate that covenant meal together of bread and wine. But the most awesome covenant meal which God and Abraham ate together is Genesis chapter 18. Now at the end of Genesis chapter 17, God had given Abraham... The command to be circumcised. And in Genesis chapter 17 verses 26 and 27. It says in the self same day. Was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house. Born in his house and bought with money of the stranger. Were circumcised with him. Abraham and his whole house. Was circumcised that day. Now chapter 17 ends. And chapter 18 opens. With heavenly visitors. Coming to visit old Abe. In Genesis chapter 18. Verses 1 through 2. It says and the Lord appeared unto him. In the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door. In the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Who appeared to Abraham? While Abraham was in, in, looking out from his tent door, it says the Lord appeared. Three men appeared, the Lord and two angels. Now, why would the Lord visit Abe? Because Abraham was his covenant friend. <laughs> and he wanted to come to Abe's house. And he wanted to visit his divine blood covenant friend. Some scholars say that this was God himself. Others say that it was again an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, Jesus is called the angel of the covenant. I believe it was the Lord Jesus that appeared to Abraham that day with these two angels. Now, where did they appear to him? It says, in the plains of Mamre. The Wycliffe Bible commentary says that Abraham lived in the immediate vicinity of Hebron. The Hebrew word for plains can be translated oak, O-A-K. And the Wycliffe Bible commentary says that these trees in the plain of Mamre were sacred trees of the Canaanite sanctuary of Hebron. And throughout the centuries, ancient oaks trees have been identified which date back to the patriarchal times. End quote. There was a grove of trees, and we're going to study about that next week, and the significance of the plains of Mamre and the oak trees. But in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 18, Abraham said, my Lord, the Hebrew word that Abraham used is Adonai. Abraham said, Adonai. And Abraham said to the Lord and the two angels, he said, don't leave, but come, come in and rest. And in verses 5 through 7, Abraham told them, let me fix you a meal. And these heavenly messengers said, all right, you go ahead. Verse 6, Abraham ran into the tent and he told his wife, Sarah, woman, you get to baking up some bread. Verse 7, Abe ran to his herd and got a young calf and told his servant to prepare that calf. Verse 8, and he took butter and honey and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Think about it. Abraham and Jesus and two angels ate a covenant meal. 
Yes, spirit beings can eat natural food. You remember after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and he said, Have you any meat? And he ate before them a piece of fish and honeycomb in Luke chapter 24, verses 37 through 43. Jesus had a resurrected body. He could walk through walls. He could appear and disappear at will. But yet he could eat natural food. The Lord Jesus... And these two angels ate a covenant meal with Abraham that day. And hallelujah, one day you and I will sit down with a, with, and eat a covenant meal with our blood covenant brother, Jesus Christ, who is our beloved bridegroom. We will eat that meal called the marriage supper of the Lamb. You remember Jesus at what we call the Last Supper when he was eating the Passover meal with his disciples. He said to them, I won't eat of this bread anymore and I won't drink of this cup anymore until I eat it and drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. One day Jesus and you and I will sit down at a covenant meal. We haven't been able to partake of that covenant meal yet. We do it in symbolism of every time we partake of communion but one day you and I will sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we will Will partake of the bread and wine with our beloved bridegroom Jesus Christ who is our blood covenant brother and he will serve us that covenant meal he will feed it to us of the broken body which represents his own body that broken bread represents Jesus body and the cup of wine represents his blood and one day at the marriage supper of the lamb Jesus our beloved bride groom will feed us that bread representing his his flesh and his body he will hand us the cup and we will drink that wine representing his blood becoming one with our blood covenant brother and friend Jesus Christ who is our beloved bridegroom Revelation chapter 19 verses 5 through 9 says and a voice came out of the throne saying praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him. For the marriage supper of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! One day you and I will partake of that marriage supper of the Lamb. We will partake of that covenant meal of bread and wine that Jesus, our beloved bridegroom, will serve us. And we will be one with him forever and forever and forever because of the blood covenant that he cut for you and for me at Calvary that day when he shed his own blood. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. And placed his blood upon us and adopted us into the family of God so that we can be heirs and join heirs with Christ and receive everything that, that he has. It now belongs to us. And hallelujah, one day you and I will sit down and partake of that covenant meal with Jesus, our beloved bridegroom. Hallelujah. Thank God, Jesus. Hallelujah. 